Chapter 32 Preparations for the Journey It was not Glenarvan's habit to lose time in adopting and executing a plan. As soon as Paganel's proposal was accepted, he at once resolved that the preparations for the journey should be completed as soon as possible. And what was to be the result of this search? The existence of Harry Grant seemed to have become undeniable, which increased the probabilities of success. No one expected to find the captain exactly on the line of the 37th parallel, but perhaps they would come upon traces of him, and, at all events, their course would bring them straight to the scene of the shipwreck, which was the principal point. Moreover, if Ayrton would consent to join the travelers, to guide them through the forests, and to the eastern coast, there was another chance of success. Glenarvan felt the importance of this arrangement, and was therefore particularly desirous of obtaining the services of Captain Grant's companion. He inquired of his host whether he was willing for him to propose to Ayrton to accompany them. Mr. Amor consented, though not without regret at losing so good an assistant. Well, Ayrton, will you aid us in our search for the sailors of the Britannia? The quartermaster did not answer immediately. He seemed to hesitate for a few moments, but finally, after reflecting, said, Yes, my lord, I will follow you. And, if I do not set you upon the track of Captain Grant, I will at least guide you to the place where his vessel was wrecked. Thanks, replied Glenarvan. One question, my lord. Ask it. Where will you join the Duncan? At Melbourne, if we do not cross Australia. On the eastern coast, if our search is continued so far. But the captain of the Duncan? He will await my orders at Melbourne. Very well, my lord, said Ayrton. Rely on me. I will, replied Glenarvan. The quartermaster was heartily thanked by the travelers. Captain Grant's children lavished upon him their most grateful caresses. All were delighted at his decision, except the colonist, who would lose in him an intelligent and faithful assistant. But he understood the importance that Glenarvan attached to this new addition to his force, and was resigned. He had, moreover, engaged to furnish them with the means of conveyance for the journey, and, this business being settled, the party returned on board. Everything was now changed, all hesitation had vanished. These courageous searchers were no longer to wander on blindly. Harry Grant, they believed, had found a refuge on the continent, and each heart was full of the satisfaction that certainty brings when it takes the place of doubt. In two months, perhaps, the Duncan would land the lost captain on the shores of Scotland. When Captain Mangles seconded the proposal that they should attempt to cross Australia with the ladies, he supposed that this time he would accompany the expedition. He therefore consulted Glenarvan on the subject, and brought forward various arguments in his own favor, such as his desire to take part in the search for his countrymen, and his usefulness in the undertaking. One question, John, said Glenarvan. You have absolute confidence in your mate? Absolute, replied he. Tom Austin is a good sailor. He will take the Duncan to Melbourne, repair her thoroughly, and bring her back at the appointed time. He is a man devoted to duty and discipline, and will never take the responsibility of changing or delaying the execution of an order. You can rely upon him as fully as on myself. Very well, Captain, replied Glenarvan. You shall accompany us. For, added he, smiling, you certainly ought to be present when we find Mary Grant's father. Ah, my lord, murmured Captain Mangles, with something like a blush upon his swarthy cheeks. The next day the captain, accompanied by the carpenter and by the sailors loaded with provisions, returned to the farm of Mr. Amor, who was to assist him in the preparations. All the family were waiting for him, ready to work under his orders. Ayrton was there, and freely gave them the benefit of his experience. He and his employer were agreed on this point, that the ladies ought to make the journey in an oxcot, and the gentlemen on horseback. The colonist could procure them the animals and vehicle. The vehicle was a cart 20 feet long and covered with an awning, the whole resting upon four wheels, without spokes, fellows, or tires. The front wheels were a long way from the hind ones, and were joined together by a rude contrivance that made it impossible to turn short. 
to the body of the cart was attached a pole 35 feet long, to which three pairs of oxen were coupled. The animals, thus arranged, drew by means of a yoke across their necks, to which the bow was fastened with an iron pin. It required great skill to manage this long, narrow, tottering vehicle, and guide the oxen by means of the whip. But Ayrton had served his apprenticeship at a moor's farm, and his employer guaranteed his dexterity. Upon him, therefore, devolved the duty of driving. The cart, being without springs, was not very easy, but our travelers were obliged to conform to circumstances as much as they could. As no change was possible in its rude construction, Captain Mangles arranged the interior in the most comfortable manner. He divided it into two compartments by a wooden partition. The rear one was designed for the provisions, the baggage, and Mr. Old Binet's portable kitchen, while the forward one was reserved exclusively for the ladies. The carpenter converted it into a convenient chamber, covered it with a thick carpet, and furnished it with a dressing table and two berths for Lady Helena and Mary Grant. Thick leathern curtains secured privacy, when necessary, and were a protection against the chilliness of the night. In rainy weather the men could find shelter under the awning, but a tent was to serve this purpose at the time of encampment. Captain Mangles succeeded in crowding into this narrow space all that two ladies could need, and Lady Helena and Mary Grant did not greatly miss the comfortable cabins of the Duncan. As for the men, seven strong horses were apportioned to Lord Glenarvan, Paganel, Robert Grant, Major McNabb, Captain Mangles, and the two sailors, Wilson and Mulready, who accompanied this new expeditionary party. The horses and oxen grazed near at hand, and could be easily collected at the moment of departure. Having made his arrangements, and given his orders to the carpenter, Captain Mangles returned on board with the colonists' family, who wished to pay Lord Glenarvan a visit. Ayrton thought proper to join them, and about four o'clock the captain crossed the gangway of the Duncan. Of course, Glenarvan invited his visitors to dinner, and they willingly accepted his return hospitality. Mr. Amor was amazed. The furniture of the cabins, the tapestry, the upholstery, and the fancy work of maple and ebony excited his admiration. Ayrton, on the contrary, gave only a secondary attention to these costly luxuries. He first examined the yacht from a sailor's point of view. He explored the hold. He went down into the engine room. He looked at the engine, inquired its effective power and consumption. He visited the coal house, the pantry, and the powder magazine, and took particular interest in the gun room and the mounted cannon in the forecastle. Glenarvan now had to deal with a man who was a critical judge, as he could see by Ayrton's keen inquiries. At last the quartermaster finished his exploration by inspecting the masts and rigging, and, after a few moments of general review, said, You have a fine vessel, my lord. A good one, too, replied Glenarvan. How many tons burden is she? 210. Shall I be greatly mistaken, added Ayrton, if I say that the Duncan can easily make 15 knots an hour at full speed? Say 17, interposed the captain, and you will be nearer right. 17, cried the quartermaster. Why, then, no man of war, not even the best, could overtake her? Not one, said the captain. The Duncan is a real racing yacht, and is not to be beaten in any way. Not even in sailing? asked Ayrton. Not even in sailing? Well, my lord, and you, captain, accept the compliments of a sailor who knows what a vessel is worth. Thanks, Ayrton, replied Glenarvan, and now remain on board, and it will be your own fault if the ship is not all you can desire. I will think of it, my lord, said the quartermaster, modestly. Mister. Old Binet now approached, and informed Lord Glenarvan that dinner was ready, and they all adjourned to the saloon. That Ayrton is an intelligent man, said Paganel to the Major. Too intelligent? growled McNabb, who, without any apparent reason, disliked the looks and manners of the quartermaster. During dinner, Ayrton gave some interesting information concerning Australia, with which he was perfectly familiar. He inquired the number of sailors that Glenarvan intended to take with him in his expedition. 
When he learned that only two, Wilson and Mulready, were to accompany them, he seemed astonished. He advised Glenarvan to form his party of the best seamen of the Duncan. He even insisted upon this point, which must have removed all suspicion from the mind of the Major. But, said Glenarvan, is there any danger in our journey across Australia? None, replied Ayrton. Well, then, let us leave on board as many as possible. There must be men to navigate the Duncan and take charge of her. It is especially important that she should arrive promptly at the place of meeting, which we will appoint hereafter. Let us not, therefore, lessen the crew. Ayrton seemed to appreciate this reason, and no longer insisted. At evening the party separated. Ayrton and Amor's family returned to their home. The horses and cart were to be ready the next day, and the travelers were to start at 8 o'clock in the morning. Lady Helena and Mary Grant now made their last preparations, which were short and less minute than those of Jacques Paganel. The geographer passed half the night in unscrewing, cleaning, and screwing on again the lenses of his telescope. He was still asleep the next morning, when the Major awoke him early with a loud summons. The baggage had already been conveyed to the farm through the care of Captain Mangles. A boat was waiting for the travelers, and they were not long in embarking. The young captain gave his last orders to Tom Austin, and instructed him above all to await the commands of Lord Glenarvan at Melbourne, and execute them scrupulously whatever they might be. The trusty sailor replied that they might rely on him. In the name of the crew he offered to his lordship their best wishes for the success of the expedition. The boat put off, and a thunder of applause rent the air. In a few moments the party reached the shore, and in no great length of time arrived at Amor's farm. Everything was ready. Lady Helena was delighted with her quarters. The immense cart, with its rude wheels and massive timbers, especially pleased her. The six oxen yoked in pairs seemed to indicate primeval simplicity, and were a novel sight. Ayrton, whip in hand, awaited the orders of his new chief. I declare, said Paganel, this is an admirable vehicle, worth all the mail coaches in the world. I know of no better way of traversing the earth than in this style, like mountebanks. A house that moves when you please and stops wherever you please is all you can desire. Monsieur Paganel, replied Lady Helena, I hope to have the pleasure of receiving you in my parlor. Madam, replied the geographer, you do me great honor. Have you chosen a day? The most devoted of all, added Paganel, gallantly. This exchange of compliments was interrupted by the arrival of seven horses, all harnessed, driven by one of Amor's sons. Lord Glenarvan paid for these new acquisitions, and added many thanks, which the honest colonist seemed to value as highly as the gold and notes which he received. The signal for departure was now given. Lady Helena and Miss Grant seated themselves in their compartment, Ayrton and Olbinet took their places respectively in front and in the rear part of the cart, while Glenarvan, the Major, Paganel, Robert, Captain Mangles, and the two sailors, all armed with carbines and revolvers, mounted their horses. A, God bless you, was Mr. Amor's parting salute, which was echoed in chorus by his family. Ayrton uttered a peculiar cry, and started his long team. The cart moved, the timbers cracked, the axles creaked, and the farm of the honest hospitable Irishman soon disappeared from view at the turn of the road.